So the outline today, we're going to be talking about clinical signs, the diagnosis, and the types of PLE, down to the treatment and the prognosis. And when I talk about types, I'm thinking of inflammatory bowel disease, lymphagectasia, and the neoplasia, and infectious, and including even almost intussusceptions. But that's kind of a minor aspect of it when I think about really PLE, because I think that probably the top two are the big ones. But technically, anything that you're losing excess of protein from GI disease is protein-losing enteropathy. So I really try to explain to clients it's really an umbrella term. Um, it's not really specifically what it is. And that's why we kind of want to go to you know, further steps of diagnosing exactly what type of PLE they have. So what are the clinical signs? It could be any of the GI signs, vomiting and or diarrhea. You don't have to have um, you know, only vomiting or only diarrhea. I think there's a misconception. A lot of people think, hey, this can't be a PLE because there's no diarrhea involved or even really obvious GI signs. Um, appetite can be really increased, decreased, or normal. And a lot of times they're having malabsorption, so they're actually polyphagic because they're trying to make up for that loss of energy, so they actually have an increased appetite. But then it gets to a point where they are pretty lethargic and not feeling well, and they can have a decreased appetite over time. A weight loss may be present, and if it's a really bad case scenario where you're actually having very low protein, you are going to see animals with increased respiratory rates and, and effort um, and uh, pleural effusion or, or abdominal effusion. That's where a lot of times when owners start to realize something's wrong and they go to the vet and they may be asymptomatic up to that point, surprisingly. I have to stress that a lot of these animals are actually normal looking. I, I can't stress to you how many times I've seen animals coming in and they were pretty normal until they kind of broke out with diarrhea and it's not getting better or they're coming in for the effusion and then I look back on the blood work and I see that the albumin was always, always low even you know like three months ago when the animal was just kind of going in for a routine checkup and, and owners had no clue. So I do think that it kind of can be deceiving to think that a PLE has to be a very sick dog. I just think that it's really important to really pay attention to that albumin when you're looking at the chemistry. Routine blood work, you know, CBC chemistry is pretty standard for, for most diseases. The key point is you're going to be low albumin. And <coughs> there's only so many things can cause low albumin. We have a decrease in production or loss through the kidneys or GI loss. Those are the big ones. Of course, you can also have you know, a blood loss or, or severe burns, but usually those cases are more straightforward because you're going to be able to find uh, where that blood is and the animal's really anemic. But I, it does help me to kind of break it down in that sense where I have a low albumin. I'm going to be thinking, is this a, a liver issue? And that's where I kind of pay attention to see what the chemistry, what the BUN, cholesterol, and glucose is doing. And if I have a, a protein-losing nephropathy, oftentimes the cholesterol is actually high, not low. And frequently the globulins are actually normal. Compared to GI ones, you're going to see low uh, globulin. And then in GI loss, if it's more significant, um, you're going to see actually low globulins and cholesterol. If it is a standard PLE, I would say most of the time you're going to see um, low globulins and cholesterol. But just because you don't see these classic changes I feel like you need to kind of look further. So when you are dealing with low albumin, I, I know there's a few clinics, not a lot around here, but there are a few that actually use human clinical path labs. Just be careful about the albumin in human labs because they can actually be normal. Dogs that actually have very low albumin, okay, just a little bit different assay. And obviously cutaneous lesions should be pretty obvious to cause low albumin. If it's that severe, it should not be... Uh, hard to find. If you just have a mild dermatitis and then you have an albumin of 1.5, I doubt it's going to be that dermatitis. It has to be pretty significant. If I do have a liver <coughs> consideration, I have to say hepatic function testing is definitely my next step. A lot of these hepatic diseases will have diarrhea. You know, it has to do with uh, the backflow of the, of, the, of the blood flow going from the intestines to the liver and if you have a cirrhotic liver, a lot of times you're going to be backing up into the intestines and then the intestines will have caused uh, permeability issues where they will definitely have diarrhea. So just because you have diarrhea does not rule out liver disease. If anything, it's most frustrating when you have both going on. And then for protein-losing nephropathy, you definitely want to use a, do urine protein creatinine ratio. With urine protein creatinine ratio, I always get it by cysto. Because a lot of times if you're doing a free catch, there's a lot of prepucial stuff that just has crud in it where you may falsely increase the, the protein values. 
And if you have an animal that you're suspicious of a UTI, definitely remember that UPC is going to be elevated. So if you have anything with an active sediment, uh, like a lot of white blood cells, I always will do a culture with a, a UPC because that way my culture is positive and I have a high UPC. I will kind of not really trust my UPC as much until I clear the infection, then I may retest again. The other thing that I have to stress is that a lot of times when you have an animal that's on IV fluids, and we always talk about trying to get that urine specific gravity, you know, in, in kidney failure prior to fluids, remember UPC doesn't matter. You could be on IV fluids or, or, or before or after. It, it won't affect it because it's, it's a ratio looking at creatinine and protein. When I have a low albumin taste, I always will definitely look for anemia because sometimes you will have that not very symptomatic dog that actually does have a mild hemoabdomen. It's, you know, they're walking around and then the anemia, anemia will be associated with that. And then I start thinking about maybe there is something going on in the abdomen or there's a uh, slow, slow bleeding intestinal mass. And that's another big one. And I'll really pay attention to the CBC when you're looking for my microcytosis. If it's just mild anemia, keep in mind, if you have a chronic PLE case, it can just be anemia, a chronic disease. Okay, so I kind of pair it, if I have a very mild, like maybe like a 35%, 32% PCV, but my albumin is 1.0, I doubt that's going to be blood loss because it's just not really in sync of the, the magnitude of how, how, how uh, much of a dramatic drop that is in the red blood cells compared to the albumin. What happens if you have a dog that you're still suspicious that there's an intestinal loss going on but the albumin is really kind of almost normal. And when I say normal, it can be low normal in chemistry. I think that we sometimes get in the habit of looking at that little chart diagram that you can see everything's in the normal range. I always have to be careful either at the low normal or high normal ranges because to me it's all relative because if an animal's a little bit dehydrated, even a albumin of maybe 2.5 may seem adequate, but really... Uh, the animal's quite dehydrated because of diarrhea. So maybe re reality, once you rehydrate them, they're really at, at 2.0. So I do have to say that I look at what is considered uh, true normal and also, uh, relatively speaking, is the animal dehydrated or not. But sometimes you do have these cases that you're really suspicious that there is GI loss and there's kind of diarrhea or, or weight loss. There's something going on, but you can't put your finger on it. But yet your blood work is not really showing the classic low albumin. And that's where uh, we often will look into another test, which is called fecal pro alpha-1 protease inhibitor. And this is a fecal test that you literally want to collect three samples, and it does go to Texas A&M. And it, because when you're having GI disease, the integrity of the intestinal mucosa may be compromised, and the proteins can be lost in the gastrolumen. If you stand, think of a standard protein, it all gets digested. But the nice thing about the alpha-1 protease in, uh, inhibitor protein that it is a proteinase inhibitor. So it does not get degraded like the rest of the proteins. And it's a very similar protein size compared to albumin. That's why uh, when you actually collect the samples, you do three consecutive sam samples, usually on diff three different days or three different bowel movements. It cannot be the same fecal matter and then you get the shipment of these little uh, tubes and they have a little spoon. It's a pre-measured one gram spoon and you have to freeze it. Ultimately, it really should be shipped frozen. So unfortunately, it's, it's just not always very convenient um, because you usually have to ship it on dry ice. You don't want to send it on Thursday because the lab doesn't run on Fridays. When you have that, it's kind of gross, but you usually tell owners to collect three samples and you put it in the freezer. And some people probably don't want to put feces in the freezer, but, but maybe they will. Or you could bring it to your clinic and you put it in your freezer. But either case, it's, it's one gram of each uh, uh, fecal sample. Okay? And it's not valid in puppies. So if you do have a young animal, um, it's not worth doing. So once you know that definitely this is GI loss, and then you're re really ready to kind of move forward. To what exactly is protein losing neuropathy? It's excessive loss of proteins, plasma proteins in the intestines. It's usually albumin is the main marker we're looking at. And some people will even measure like antithrombin, but usually your albumin is going to be on your chemistry. But antithrombin is also very similar size to uh, albumin. But either case, the big ones are inflammatory bowel disease, lymphangiectasia, which is has primary and secondary form, and then there's infectious. And usually the, the ones that I'm thinking is histoplasmosis and pithiosis, and then even parvovirus in a young animal. 
And the neoplasia, the big ones are lymphoma, carcinoma, and leiomyosarcomas. So just on a really short slide regarding young dogs with PLE, it's, it's sometimes very straightforward because most of the time it's going to be something infectious and parvovirus is obviously the big one. But what's interesting is that sometimes you will have these partial obstructions and they are chronic nociceptions. It can even be sliding where the diarrhea never goes away. And if it never goes away, yet the parvovirus infection has been treated and, it, and the dog is feeling better, but yet the diarrhea continues on, I do want to, uh, a lot of people think about chronic insusception because it's really easy to miss. And then usually these guys can also be loaded with parasites, and that can maybe contribute to the insusception, and typically we're seeing the whips or the hooks. But usually with these young dogs, they're kind of acute, and then eventually they become kind of chronic if it is, it is, there is an insusception. I'm always surprised how long a dog can go with an insusception without uh, final detection because, you know, they could range from anywhere from weeks to, to even a month or two, you know, especially if you have a sliding one that comes and goes uh, where they're not fully obstructed. Uh, these are really tricky to diagnose. And typically, uh, we just ultrasound them and you're looking for certain uh, lesions, like a target lesion. But, um, but they are definitely tricky, especially the ones that are not consistently uh, present radiographs are often normal, you know, because again, they're not fully obstructed, so uh, you, you can easily miss it in a susception. Once we get to the point where we are definitely dealing with a PLE case, you know, how do we go about truly diagnosing it? I always explain to the owners, you have to get a biopsy. That is a gold standard. It is not something that you can run blood work and tell you, yes, there is this disease. It kind of guides you that there is low um, albumin and maybe low al uh, cholesterol and low globulins, but the problem is you don't know what type of disease the animal will have. So biopsies, you know, you could go from endoscopic to surgical biopsy to laparoscopic biopsies. And there's pros and cons, you know, with, with each uh, type of modality. I do have to stress that, you know, I always explain that there are actually four different layers to the intestinal tract. You have the mucosa, then submucosa, then the muscularis, and then the serosa. A lot of times with certain types of diseases, you know, like inflammatory bowel disease, a lot of times it is in this region, you know, top one, two layers. And then the lymphoma really likes to hide in that third layer, you know, the muscularis layer. And then obviously the easy ones are when its um, entire uh, intestinal tract is infiltrated with some type of um, uh, abnormal cell. The way that I like to proceed with these guys, especially with a true protein losing enteropathy, when you're talking about an albumin of 1.2, 1.5, you know, anything less than 2.0, uh, I really feel that endoscopic way is the best way just because it's so non-invasive, relatively speaking. Uh, you don't have to worry about dehiscence. You don't have to worry about, um, you know, just a healing aspect, especially with animals with effusion. You're about to open up an abdomen full of fluid and you have to close it back up. They're still going to make more fluid. And, and I think there's definitely a, a higher surgical risk from an anesthetic, uh, anesthetic, anesthetic standpoint. The other big thing is that when you are actually in the lumen, I can really see what I'm looking at uh, in specifically in the GI tract compared to a surgeon's view is that it's going to be from serosa. And they're not going to open up the entire, you know, GI tract. They're just going to look and feel and, and then you start to take your biopsies in certain locations. It's always amazing um, how laparotomy and um, laparoscopic biopsies can actually get non-diagnostic samples uh, compared to endoscopy just because, again, it's more the visualization. Because even laparoscopically, you're going to be pulling out a loop about and then, then you, cut, you cut your sample, you know, out from the cirrhosis side in versus endoscopically, I'm only on the, uh, I'm only on the internal or in the lumen. But the downside is that I'm definitely not getting full thickness. Uh, you know, we're going to only get probably the mucosa and a little bit of the submucosa. And in occasion, I'll even get a little bit of muscularis. But a lot of times, it's kind of this top, you know, one, two layer. But the good news is that most of the diseases I feel I can still diagnose, I would say probably 90% of the time, I can still get an answer with endoscopic biopsies. But I do, I definitely still feel like surgery has its place, especially in an animal that has a more focal lesion. When you're ultrasounding, there's one segment of bowel that's really thick. I definitely say, hey, you just need to go to surgery. When do we proceed with GI biopsies? Really, I feel like all patients with PLE should get, get further diagnosis because, you, again, you don't know what type of uh, disease they have. 
you can just say that you have intestinal disease and you're losing protein. And I find it even more important when it's less than 2.0 because then you're going to start to get to that critical uh, phase where they could start to have effusions. And I think once you start effusions, it could be definitely a little bit trickier. There's a little bit higher anesthetic risks. You know, usually I find the effusions taking place you know, anywhere from a 1.2 albumin. Anything less than 1.5, you can start to have effusion. I have to say that sometimes I'm surprised that I do have some dogs walking around at 0.8 albumin with no effusion at all, you know. And I suspect it's something with the chronicity of it, and maybe they, they adapt it, and there's other uh, uh, ways to kind of get that oncotic pressure up, I guess. But, it, but either case, um, it, it varies on when the animal can develop effusion, but I, I find less than 1.5, you're definitely going to hit a little bit of a more higher chance. I also want to stress that if you are interested in doing the you know, non-invasive things, and, and to me, even endoscopic biopsies are really non-invasive, but, but t- technically it does require anesthesia, and some owners are just not willing, you know, you could do the antibiotic trial and the dietary responsive diarrhea trials, but it really it takes about three to six weeks sometimes to see if they respond. If you have a dog that has very low albumin, sometimes you don't have that three to six weeks to wait. If you have a very stable dog, it, it, it's definitely very reasonable. But usually when I have an albumin that low, I feel like this is something more serious than just a standard antibiotic responsive or dietary responsive diarrhea. I also want to stress that once a fusion kind of hits, the albumin can really drop very quickly. You can go from a 2.0 to a 1.0 very rapidly. So I, I feel that things can change very quickly. So that's why I'm usually trying to get to the diagnosis and scoping them a little bit sooner. But again, I get a skewed population. I get the ones that are kind of sick. They've already gone through everything. And so I know I'm not the first line of defense. So I know that my population is still a little bit different than what you may be seeing. I do feel that when I really highly recommend GI biopsy is when you have a chronic um, uh, cat that has been vomiting forever, having diarrhea forever, those are the cases where, where almost owners feel it's normal for, to vomit like once a week or so, and then suddenly they are increasing to maybe two, three times a week. If I have an animal that's definitely getting worse from a chronic form of GI disease, I really worry about GI lymphoma. Um, Because that's often the case where they have the the slow inflammatory bowel disease, no big deal, they get used to it, and then ultimately it will transition to um, lymphoma. So I'd rather get going on those cases too because they will eventually get ill. I really don't recommend trying prednisolone trial. I realize you are going to have those clients that just can't do anything. And, you know, I see them too. Again, I have a skew population where by the time they're referred, they're usually they are going to be the ones that are going to want to do a little bit more. But sometimes you do have the situation where, you know, can I just try this? And I just really want to stress that if you're going to do it, you just have to need to let the owner know that, you know, if they change their mind and once they start to feel a little bit better, then they decide, hey, this is worth doing now. I really want to get a diagnosis. Once you start that steroid, it really can decrease diagnostic yield. So it's always better to kind of get your biopsies on an animal that doesn't have any steroids on board because occasionally we will biopsy them and, and but we, and the animal's so sick and they're not really responding but they already have been on steroids. I feel like their, their biopsy result sometimes is not as impressive than compared to how sick the animal is and oftentimes it is because of the steroids partially inhibiting that inflammation or even lymphoma. And then I also tell owners for the ones that say, why can't I just try this uh, steroid? I just say, are you committed for the lifelong? You know, if you are, it's one of those things that there are side effects, especially for a dog. When do you start to wean down the steroids? Um, If I have really evidence that says, hey, this is really severe, I really feel like I need to go ahead and, and do the steroids. At least I feel like there's a reason versus just kind of trying it. And those are always really hard to guide the owners because then they'll usually call me saying, gosh, the animal can't tolerate the steroids. But I'll tell them they kind of hang in there because your dog has, you know, this type of inflammation and, and you really need it and versus the animal that I really just don't know. I just feel like the, some of the steroids are, are pretty, pretty dramatic on, on the effects on the animal. So I just need to warn the owners that you're just going to try it. I just don't know if it's worth the side effects if I don't have a true conclusive diagnosis. If it is lymphoma, it definitely will uh, build up resistance to chemotherapy. And that's, that goes with almost any lymphoma case in particular, even with big lymph nodes, you try it a little bit, and then they decide that the dog is doing much better, and two months later they decide, hey, I, I kind of want to do the chemo. And now they, they kind of uh, build up resistance. You know, there's that um, 
a peak glycoprotein pump that pumps out all the drugs. And, and it, we see it in the GI cases too. So a lot of these animals are on, on steroids and then they just don't seem to be as responsive to the chemo drugs. And if it is infectious and you do try steroids, sometimes it definitely will get worse. Um, I had a really bad um, uh, a case, I remember. It was a histoplasmosis case. And I, I think that I kind of killed the cat in certain ways because the cat was really, really scared, chronic diarrhea. And then I'm like, well, why would we wait for bio? You know, the cat is so thin, and I just wanted to help it as soon as I can. So I got my biopsies, started the steroids, and then I got my biopsy res result and said it's histoplasmosis. I'm like, ah, you know, you got to stop now, and, and, and you know, we've got to get you on. Uh, you know, antifungals, and then the cat just didn't do well, and they just kind of, you know, ultimately, you know, died. And and I wonder, back in my head, gosh, should I have waited a little bit longer to wait for my biopsies? And sometimes I feel, um, you know, if it's a stable animal, now I tend to wait a little bit longer, unless I really feel pretty confident that this is not any kind of infectious. But I was really blown away by that biopsy uh, result. GI endoscopy. So I have some clips, but they're not going to work exactly on the slides. But ultimately, that's my, my modality for, for most of the, the PLE cases. And again, sometimes you'll just have focal lesions. So if you're, you're outside and you're looking in, you're no, there's no way you're going to find this lesion, and you're not going to know to biopsy it. Sometimes it's definitely more diffuse, so thank goodness most inflammatory bowel diseases and uh, lymphatic tasia cases are often diffuse, but a lot of times they can be segmentally focal or just focal in general. Um, they're almost like polka dots, you know, um, throughout the GI tract, and then you just have to find one of the polka dots to get your biopsy samples. And the other thing about uh, scoping is that when I'm doing endoscopic biopsies, usually I'll probably get, I don't know, at least five to ten pieces in the, from the stomach and then probably about 15 pieces maybe from the small intestine. You know, you could ask my technician because usually like, they're asking me, when am I going to finish? And I, and I want to get enough. I always explain, I'm going to get enough until I can make a little mouse you know, intestine. So then you can you know, link it together. Um, but, but there is a reason because there actually um, has been studies to show you what are the yield. And sometimes it's amazing because when you do biopsies endoscopically, Literally, if you have like five uh, poor samples, you're not going to get a diagnosis. And but you'll increase your yield if you you know increase to 20 samples, even with fair sample quality, you might get your diagnosis. So it's amazing that it's it's not just uh, the quality of your sample, but also the the biopsy number. You get, can you often get a sense of the disease process you're dealing with based on what the mucus looks grossly? That's a good question. I always tell owners that you really can't. Um, I have had cases where I'm like, that looks kind of rough to me. I, you know, it just looks a little bit thickened, but then I'll get my biopsy sample and it's normal. And then sometimes I'll say, it looks pretty normal, and it'll be small cell lymphoma. <coughs> so I think that some of the definitely from a gross visualization, it's a really a true microscopic bi uh, diagnosis. But occasionally I'll get a little bit rougher you know, patches, and, and I feel like there's definitely some type of infiltrate that's making it thicker. So, so yes and no, but I, I definitely don't. I feel like the, if you just go by gross visualization, you're probably going to be successful maybe 20% of the time. Unless it's a mass or ulcer, you know, those are the ones that's very classic. And the other big one that's really classic is the lymphatic tasia cases, if you have a duodenal uh, lymphatic tasia. And it, they all look like little tiny pinpoint white uh, dots. And it's pretty cool to look at. Um, and usually if I see something like that, I'll usually tell owners, you have the dilated lacteals. But what's interesting is when you get the biopsy sample, a lot of times they will not call it. They'll say mild dilation. I'm like, how can it be mild? It was so extensive when, when I looked at it grossly. But keep in mind, whenever you're taking a, a forceps, you're, you're pinching it, you're popping those. So they just get a deflated um, lacteal. So a lot of times you don't get to see that full-blown um, balloon. You just kind of get the deflated balloon. So I do feel that um, gross visualization on the uh, lymphatic tasia cases are definitely very helpful visually. When you're talking about inflammatory bowel disease, really it's just a, it's a group of disorders characterized by persistent or recurrent clinical signs of GI disease uh, of undetermined cause associated with histologic evidence of inflammation, you know, inflammatory infiltration of the small and or large uh, intestine. A lot of times when I see IBDs, they're probably going to be some type of eosinophilic, lymphocytic, or lymphoplasmacytic. Those are the kind of the main categories. Occasionally I get these weird uh, pyogranulomatous. That always really bothers me a lot um, because then I think of fungals. 
but that's probably the, the two uh, big classic ones. Whenever you're talking about inflammatory bowel disease, there's a lot of concern about what is considered normal. You know, if you talk to a pathologist, sometimes they're having a hard time even quantifying what is IBD, um, you know, where is it in the uh, histologic area along the, the villi, to the, the, the cribs, to, you know, all the lamina propria, all those different segments of the GI tract when they're looking at, uh, microscopically. And that in itself is already frustrating. So it depends on which pathologies you're using. Sometimes you might have different opinions on what is considered IBD. So that's, they are trying to standardize it more. I don't, I don't know how successful it is, but, it, but ultimately I think people are still starting to get a little bit more on, on the same page. But ultimately it's very difficult. Then from a clinical standpoint, it's hard to say, well, what is IBD? Because there's so much, of, it's a spectrum. And so people did try to quantify a little bit more. So they tried to put this clinical IBD activity index where they really try to attempt to develop a simple scoring system to assess the dynamic changes that reflect the course of the IBD. The downside with this is really subjective. And then, and at least when this first study came out, it's really the, there's no long-term uh, follow-up you know, following these cases. It's a very small caseload. Whenever you're reading journal articles, they're always, everybody's always criticizing, well, how do we standardize this? So that way one university could be talking about IBD, another one could be talking about the same disease and what is considered, you know, the level of severity. So that's what they're just trying to um, set up. So then, you know, another paper came out, and ultimately it, it, they gave another name. It's a canine chronic enteropathy clinical activity index. It's very similar to the, the previous index I just described, but they just added a few more objective parameters, you know, albumin concentration, presence of ascites, and presence of peripheral edema, and also pruritus. Uh, and that one has a little bit bigger study with 70 dogs, and they were able to actually follow the, the cases out, and that's why they could say, hey, if you look at these scoring systems, the, the, the ones that did worse um, often were um, these ad additional ob objective parameters. So again, these are kind of the, the things that they start to quantify, you know, they kind of give a number, you know, added to one through, you know, zero through five or something like that, activity level of the animal, vomiting, and stool consistency, stool frequency, weight loss, and then later on the, the second group also added albumin levels ascites or peripheral edema and then pruritus. I think that's great from an academic standpoint. I think ultimately, I think we all kind of know when an animal's really sick, you know, but I think it's just nice to kind of communicate what level it is and they just have to give a number, but, but ultimately I, I, I don't use these indices, you know, you're just, I, I really just kind of follow more the objective values, which is usually the albumin and then obviously the clinical response. Inflammatory bowel disease, you know, is definitely the increased mucosal permeability which perpetuates inflammation. What's interesting is that dietary proteins are one of the most immunogenic antigens the gut is exposed to. After a confirmed diagnosis of medical treatment, I will consider changing that diet, but I have to stress this after. I think that a lot of people will start animals on these novel protein diets in particular, thinking, oh, I hear IBD may be related to food allergies, but the problem with that is that the permeability of the intestines is still active. And, and then in, when you have that, there's going to be increased exposure to various antigens. And if you don't calm that system down and you say, hey, I'm going to go and switch over to venison, that inflammation is still active. It's just going to recognize a new you know, protein, and then usually they, they feel better for maybe one, two, maybe even three weeks. But then down the road, exact same problem again. I always tell owners that you really don't want to use these novel protein diets because there's only so many of them. I, I will, however, kind of go in more detail maybe hydrolyzed proteins, but the main thing that I typically do if, if I'm not going to diagnose IBD yet, I, I definitely are, uh, I'm in the camp of using a bland diet. You know, these are the IONS Gastrointestinal Plus, the low-fat ID or regular ID, and then the Perina EN, so any of the, the bland GI diets. But I try to stay away from any of these specialized diets um, until I get a confirmed uh, diagnosis of IBD. And unfortunately now, too, a lot of owners are kind of going out buying their own venison or whatever because they kind of hear from the grapevine that so-and-so's dog has IBD and they're on venison and it's doing great. And they don't know the whole picture that, yeah, the animal is also on steroids and such. IBD can be quite complex because it's not a simple fix because there's several different factors that may contribute to IBD. You know, there, there's definitely probably a genetic component and then you have the immune system that's kind of overreactive and then you have the inflammation depending on what type 
and then you have the environmental factors, really the uh, intestinal microbiota, you know, just like your, your normal flora for the intestines, and then you have that dietary antigens. The problem is not every animal has like 25% of this, 25% genetic. It's some animals is, you know, 75, 80% is, is related to the environmental factors. And maybe, you know, uh, it, the immune system is, is a smaller player, but the once you control this, this will kind of calm down. Then you have some other animals that are really truly primary immune stimulated, and you can't control that as much ex except for immune suppression. And the diet may have a less role, uh, uh, a less uh, dramatic effect. But either case, it's just not straightforward for every single animal. When we deal with medical management, there, there's always going to be typically immune suppression. I, I'm a 1 to 2 mg per kg BID uh, person. I tend to do more of the 2 mg per kg. But, but I do my max out on, no matter how large the animal is, I will max out at 40 mg BID. And then I taper it every two to three weeks, and then sometimes three to four, depends how well they're handling the drugs. Or you'll see me kind of taper it down a little bit slower toward when the drugs are going down a little bit. And it's really based on clinical response and albumin. Especially the nice thing about that protein losing enteropathy, you have something more to go on than just the dog has no diarrhea. Because there's plenty of dogs, again, that don't even have diarrhea, but their albumin could be 1.2. If you have a true protein losing enteropathy, and albumin was started at 1.2, I want to see it go up and up, and it should be back to normal. Corambusol is another one that I may, might use as my second tier, um, especially for uh, cats, but I definitely will do it in dogs too. And a lot of times it could be on it forever, and sometimes it will be a more a little bit short-lived. And then you have cyclosporin as another one. Uh, down thing about, downside about cyclosporin, sometimes it, it naturally has a GI side effect. Sometimes it can vomit or have diarrhea with it. So, um, But I think most animals tolerate it pretty well. And I don't know... If, if you guys also do this, but, you know, the rule of thumb is sometimes putting it in the refrigerator for, you know, and it's cold, and then you give it to the animal, then it, it, it tends to be a little bit easier on the GI tract. Um, but supposedly the rep told us that it's only like truly stable for like seven days in the fridge. So usually I tell owners to leave the, 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 their, their box out and then maybe put seven days worth at a time, and that way you're always giving it kind of cold. It seems to work. Azathioprine is another one. Um, that, that you can utilize, and, and azathioprine is usually, you know, two mix per kg once a day for about seven to 14 days. I tend to be more on the seven days, and I go to every other day. I have not been very happy with azathioprine, so I really don't use this. I, I feel that I'm definitely a more chlorambucil if I'm going with a second tier drug. Um, and azathioprine definitely can cause liver toxicity, so uh, I, I'm a little bit more hesitant to use that too. And, and keep in mind, azathioprine is not immediately acting, so it does take about one to two weeks to kind of kick in. So uh, if I have a really bad PLE case, sometimes I'm not going to wait, you know, one to two weeks. There are limited studies, you know, regarding what, which drugs really work well. There, there was a study in, it's actually an abstract, technically, for Journal of Internal Medicine, or the abstract group at ACIM in 2011, that also compare the two types of treatment of dogs with PLE. One, one group was prednisolone with azathioprine, and the other one was prednisolone with chlorambucil. And they felt that the, the cases that had the chlorambucil group was actually a, a much uh, better in, in the improvement uh, of the clinical signs. It was interesting because it was actually the response to therapy was, was uh, much greater in the albumin I mean, th there's an increase in albumin using the core ambucil group. What they did was they started out with, they got, they got azathioprine first, and then they got core ambucil later, you know, and then that way everybody kind of got the same set of treatments. The medial survival time for the dogs with the azathioprine was around 30 days, and, but then core ambucil was up to even 500 days. Uh, so they just thought it was a, definitely survival was positively associated with core ambucil group. But again, it was, it was, it was a retrospective study, um, in certain ways because they're just looking at ones that, got, got ch that changed in, in their drug and we really don't have a true group one, group two and then, and then and, and as a prospective study. What about mycophenol? Mycophenol, I do not um, find IBD as a responsive but I don't think it's wrong, you know, uh, but I, I think I would try to use my core ambucel for sure and my cyclosporin. I don't think there's enough data um, on mycophenolate but that's a good point because a lot of times I think about all these <coughs> new suppressive drugs and now that's such a popular drug it seems like IBD, for the same reason I don't really use azathioprine, I don't think it, it works on the GI very well.
So what happens to that dog that is not able to tolerate a prednisone? And you're going to definitely get those calls to say, gosh, my dog is peeing in the house, can't stand it, you know, because you're, you're talking about high doses. The main thing is that when you have a PLE dog, some of these cases are just so skinny when they come to you. You know, they've been living with it for so long. And those definitely worry me when you're so skinny and you're about to put on immune suppressive dose of the prednisone because it definitely has significant muscle atrophy. And they just look horrible when you start treatment sometimes. I get very nervous. So those are the dogs I sometimes slightly underdose a little bit. You know, I, I definitely will not go, to, if, if the dog calculates out to be 40 milligrams twice a day, I'll definitely maybe do 30 milligrams. I'll just kind of err on the little bit lower end. The main thing that I like to use is really budesonide. And budesonide is, is uh, animals that aren't able to tolerate prednisone or dexamethasone. And it's re related to the 16 alone. And it really has a high topical anti-inflammatory activity. So that's kind of cool because it really attacks at the GI tract. So that's where the inflammation is. So this is why I feel budesonide is a great drug. And it really has low systemic activity. You know, there's a very high first pass effect. These dogs, you know, really, if they cannot handle prednisone, I will switch them to budesonide. I do find it slightly better in the colonic IBDs than I do in the small intestinal. Um, or the stomach, but but it's still, if you can't tolerate the pred, then this, this is definitely the, the way to go. Budesonide is really expensive in the non-generic form. You really have to have it compounded to make it affordable for most clients. I want to say, like, for a medium-sized dog, you'll probably be in the $200, $300 a month range for the brand name. And they come in uh, two milligram capsules. But if you get it compounded, uh, it could be significantly less. It depends on what kind of uh, compounding pharmacies you tend to use. Be aware that I did have an experience where I had one budesonide come in from one pharmacy. dog didn't respond as well, and another dog was doing great. It was from a different compounding pharmacy, and I, I just switched to a different compounding pharmacy, and that dog did much, did much better. So, so with any compounded drugs, I do feel that sometimes the efficacy may be a little bit off. If you're not happy with it, you may want to try a different compounding pharmacy before you just give up on the drug. And I definitely don't want to do budesonide and steroids together. If I have a dog that is going to be on budesonide and um, after they just can't tolerate PRED, I kind of have a, a slight washout period, you know, hopefully just maybe two, three days, but I definitely don't want to do back-to-back -back or on, on the same day because you, you can still potentially have ulcerations. It's still a steroid. There's still some systemic absorption. And if you're on it chronically, you still can have some of those cushionoid look appearance, but it just takes much longer time to get to that point. Definitely way better than PRED if you can't tolerate it. A lot more expensive, and, and so my first line is still PRED. So Depomedrol, I know that um, a lot of people want to pull out the Depomedrol sometimes for the cats that, you know, animals can't be pilled, and it's a steroid, and you, you think it's IBD. I'm just a big no-no on Depomedrol because it's not going to be a constant therapeutic level. You know, when you're talking about IBDs or immune suppressive, you need to be on a constant pharmacokinetic, you know, study immune suppressive level. With Depomedrol, you're kind of doing this curve where it's effective and then it lasts and it starts to come drop down and then it lasts for like 30 days and sometimes even longer. And ultimately, I need a flat line that's all therapeutic. And I don't find that if you have an IBD case, you're going to be able to manage it that way. And they can improve a little bit, but you're not going uh, to truly get the full effect of what a constant level of prednisolone would do, for, for, you know, for example, for a cat. The, in the Depomedrol, you know, it's more associated with diabetes and all the negative side effects. of You get the bad effects of the steroids, but you're really not getting the benefit. So medical management, what else can you do besides immune suppressive drugs? Um, I definitely want to consider modulation of the microbiota to decrease inflammation. You're really trying to reduce the, the immune response to even the enteric ba uh, bacteria that may be a little bit more irritating to the GI tract. Because a lot of times these animals, when they have chronic diarrhea, it really does shift the whole normal flora for that patient. There's a dysbiosis. And, and people, I'm sure, looking around the room, probably a lot of people know SIBO, you know, the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So now you know you're old because that's not used anymore. <laughs> so, um, 
So SIBO, uh, people used to say small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you know, you have so many. Then people try to culture, how many is too many? Then they did studies where they looked at normal dogs and there's like huge overlap. Some of them have tons of bacteria. And then and some people don't have a lot, and then yet they're all normal. So there's just too much variation. So they thought that's just a bad terminology. And who's going to call, culture the GI tract and say, how many bacteria colony counts do I have to consider SIBO? So it's just totally uh, not a very useful term. So then they call it dysbiosis. But now I even hear the term like antibiotic responsive diarrhea, and that was kind of trending for a while too. Because ultimately, you're just changing the flora a little bit. And, and the big ones that we use is metronidazole and tylosin. I do have to say that the metronidazole, it does have anti-inflammatory properties. I do use metronidazole more for colonic signs. I find small intestinal um, uh, disease, like weight loss and even severe disease in the small intestine, but normal in the colon, I, do, I don't think metronidazole works as well. I think that's why colitis is great with metronidazole. Tylosin, on the other hand, tends to work better uh, on the small intestines. And I probably should add in uh, doxycycline uh, as another uh, antibiotic responsive diarrhea. Even it's weird because sometimes animals get doxycycline, they'll get diarrhea, but sometimes you can use the tetracycline family also is worth trying. Now, probiotics, there's a lot of you know, parallel between human medicine and veterinary medicine. You hear owners kind of, hey, I hear, who's that lady that eats yogurt all the time? And she's always like talking about her digestive, short hair, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, exactly. So I know that like there's just a lot of advertisements about, you know, great yogurts, great, you know, uh, bacteria for you to re re reclaim your gut. I mean, ultimately, you cannot use human bacteria uh, that is normal for us and put it in a cat or a dog. We're not the same GI, you know. First of all, we don't eat poop, and, and sometimes dogs do. It's just like there's so many different variations of what GI um, tracks are doing. So... I feel like it's really tricky to say try to just buy a probiotic that's human and then say, hey, it's going to work for the dog. Theoretically, I think Prostora is the only one, at least they claim, that they're the only ones that they kind of cultured some normal dogs and kind of found you know, this type of bacteria, thought it was healthier for the gut. I am not married to any of these probiotics. I don't use it. But if I have that owner that's really into it, it's not going to hurt. I, I'm totally fine. You know, Fortiflora, so be it. But I have yet to really find one that says, wow, this animal's doing great on it. Uh, it it's really probably my pred or, or the diet change. But I'm not against it, but I, I try to min minimize how many pills the animal's getting, you know, uh, if possible. And I don't know, this is totally a side. I don't know, have you ever seen, like, um, there's another cool thing that people are doing with, it, with bacteria, maybe changing it. If, have you heard of, like, fecal transplants? So, so that's what, you know, so, so some person did it with a dog. I can't imagine the first human that did it, but in either case, um, either case, you know, the, you know, they did it, the dog just was not getting better, and ultimately, you know, put some feces in the dog and, and like did this enema thing, and, and the dog supposedly did really well. But and I don't, I always never know like there's like that, you know, you know, like those transplant kits that you're running with a fecal matter, running to emergency room and say I got it, you know. But I, I don't, I don't know if it would work. I've never tried it, but but I find that that's kind of interesting concept. I could totally see like plasma donation, fecal donation, you know, like you go in line, you know, like. <laughs> but um, sorry, my mind. I, I, I okay, I won't talk about feces anymore. Um, so prescription diets. Again, usually when I have a PLE case while I'm waiting for biopsy results, I'm more the, the bland diet first. So, you know, the ID low fat, they often don't tolerate, you know, fat in these uh, cases, especially lymphatectasia. And, and my favorite is still kind of the Royal Canyon low fat, but then ID did come out with their, their low fat ID. So low fat ID is different than regular ID. Um, and I feel it's a little bit more digestible, so it's a little bit pretty comparable. I believe the, the Royal Cane is still a slightly lower fat compared to the low fat ID even. I like it because they come in canned and dried version. And it seems to be more you know, effective when I talk about low fat stuff is more for cats, I mean dogs, you know, than, than cats. Cats, you know, I'm gonna, it's whatever the cat's gonna be willing to eat. They're gonna be a little bit more finicky. So you're talking about EN, you know, gastrointestinal plus any ID, um, really doesn't matter. And then, uh, then you're talking about these novel protein uh, diets. The novel protein diets, you know, really have the duck, the venison, and, and the rabbit, and then the kangaroo. 
I would even put fish on there, but now there's like fishes everywhere. There's like a lot of these, unfortunately, are kind of making it into mainstream diets. Because again, you hear this, oh, my itchy dog is doing so great on, on lamb. And now look, lamb is not even considered a novel protein diet. We're seeing that also with venison, you know. So it, it kind of sucks, you know, that, that it's kind of, we're not, I don't think we're educating the clients well enough that people are going out and you have these competitive non-prescription diets that sometimes they will still put chicken meal in a venison diet and, and you have to really read the, the ingredients to really know, is this a true novel protein? And a lot of times owners don't want to pay the prescription, but yet these novel protein diets over the counter are still quite expensive. So I really stress to them that, that you really want to stick with the prescription diets if you can. I'm not a huge fan of the duck just because it tends to be a little bit higher in fat. You know, it's a little bit more rich. I, my, my first line is still usually venison just because I know a lot of people will get access to deer meat. So I'm just thinking home cooked diets. If they ever don't want to feel, if they feel sick and you have to do home cooked diets, it's easier to tell them to get some venison meat and cook it yourself and then give the, you know, the potato and venison or rice and venison homemade when the animal's sick and so that it's standard chicken and rice. I remember I had a, um, a, a Spanish speaking family that just didn't speak English really well. And I was trying to explain, you know, because the diagnosis was IBD and we got to switch over to venison. They just like didn't understand what venison was. And I was like, the deer. And then they're like, you know what? And I'm like, like Bambi. And you're like, oh, Bambi. So, so, so if you ever get in that situation, Bambi, everyone knows Bambi. The thing that, that also sucks, you know, like I said, it's like when you run out of these novel protein diets, I use kangaroo and oats as my last resort. Again, it's hard to find kangaroo meat in the States. I just feel that there, there's really only so many diets left that I don't know what's going to happen when it really goes into mainstream that there is no novel protein. You're going to find like the chupacadra or the, you know, the Bigfoot, something I don't know. I just don't, I just don't know what you're going to find as a novel protein. Yeah. My wife's dog has both. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's going to be, have to be home cooked. That's what you call, um, call like the UT nutritionalist group and they will kind of formulate something. You know, that, that works well, but it, usually those are the home cooked diets if they just won't eat the prescription diets. Okay, then you have the hydrolyzed um, protein diet. What exactly is that? That literally is just a low molecular weight peptides, and it's really digestible and supposedly has a, you know, low antigenic potential. But I, I want to stress that making the protein smaller does not prevent the epitopes from being exposed to the immune system. Remember back in immunology, your epitopes are the, the things that, that kind of poke out and then your immune system will actually see, you know, as, as foreign, okay, that's part of the antigen. I think that if you really want to refine it so they really can't see, you, you, you kind of have to use an elemental amino acid, you know, um, diet, which is really not very practical. The smaller you go on proteins too, it definitely can affect the digestibility and the taste even. Because you're really just denaturing this protein so it's not even truly, you know, what it really is anymore. And sometimes it can even increase the osmolarity and, and there are some cases where you actually make the diarrhea worse with hydrolyzed protein occasionally. But I still say it's, it's worth trying sometimes because it's still better than just trying to go into a novel protein. You're kind of on that fence before you, you use one of those precious novel proteins. Because there are definitely some cases with animals that are allergic to a certain protein and, and they won't react to the same hydrolyzed protein, but then there's about, people say about 20% of them will still react. I also want to stress that a lot of times these hydrolyzed protein, when you look at molecule size, it's kind of a bell-shaped curve. It's not like every single one is exactly this molecular weight molecule. You just can't do that. It's not that uniform. So you're going to have this bell-shaped curve. Some um, peptides are really small, then some of them are a little bit bigger, and some are even a little bit bigger than that. And then even maybe the majority of them are small, you're, just the fact that you still have these middle to a little bit higher protein sizes, it's going to still be a antigen. Does anyone have any questions? You're talking about the novel proteins. Um, also pay attention to your carb source because I get some of them that are real sensitive to rice because we have so many diets that are rice-based now yeah. that you end up having to go to potatoes or yeah. other things. I think that I definitely would try that if you're really truly having problems, but I, I do feel like right now everyone's on this gluten-free and then the you know and anti-rice thing. I feel like I don't see it as much, but I, I'm sure they're out there, you know. But I feel like the most antigenic stimulation is still the protein. And if you're going to start to eliminate so much, it's going to be even harder and harder to try to find that diet that doesn't even have rice in it. But, but you are going to be right that if it seems like it's not working, 
you can look further, but sometimes it, it, it may even be better that is it because the, the protein itself is, is still antigenic. So I might even be more averse to try, trying a different protein before I just change it to a non-rice. But it's, it doesn't do any harm, though, if you can find a, a, a protein with a, with a non-rice first, yeah. but it's just hard. I, I try to take something completely different, you know, like, you know, yeah. like a fish and potato or something yeah. that they've never seen. Yeah, but then that's where it's hard, because is it because of the fish, you know what I mean, yeah. or is it the protein? So those are always hard questions to, to answer, but I, I know that there's a lot of people all in this gluten-free carbohydrate kick, but actually carbohydrates is not as, it breaks down so easily, but it's not as much as what the, yeah. the animal source is, you know. Yeah. Our second part, pretty much I'm going to be talking about a little bit lymphangiectasia and briefly about lymphoma. Um, the main thing is when I think of PLE, I think of IBD, and my second group is really lymphagectasia. And you can have both. Lymphagectasia is one of the more frustrating diseases for me because, unfortunately, sometimes the immune suppressive therapy is just not enough. It's, it's just not uh, um, as responsive because there's probably something more going on than, than just an a autoimmune response. With lymphagectasia, you think of primary and primary can be genetic or con congenital or idiopathic acquired, okay? The ones that we seem to see most often that are kind of breeds that are overrepresented are Yorkshire Terriers, Maltese, Poodles, and soft-coated Wheaton Terriers in, in the Norwegian Loonhound. The secondary form of lymphangiectasia, which I probably see more often, is oftentimes associated with the IBD cases and sometimes neoplasia, and then right-sided heart failure, or even portal hypertension. And those are the cases, like I said, portal hypertension are the ones that you have PLE, but you also have elevated bile acid. So you do have liver failure and intestinal disease, because a lot of times the barrier is broken because of, of the portal hypertension, and that's why you get diarrhea. So if you scope these guys, sometimes you'll, you'll definitely see dilated lacteals. At least with the IBDs, it's kind of which came first, the chicken or the egg. Some people feel that the inflammation comes first, or the classic IBD, and it starts crowding. The, uh, you know, the white blood cells start crowding the lymph uh, lymphatic system, the lacteals, and it kind of pinches their, their flow. So then you start to have congestion. And then some people feel lymphatectasia comes first on some cases where you have dilated lacteals and they literally start popping, and then you'll actually leak out lymphatic fluid, and that irritates the GI tract, and then, then you get inf secondary inflammation. How do I know which comes first? Sometimes I'll look at the severity. You know, I have a dog right now that I think is a lymphagectasia case, but does, does, it's pretty severe, came out with ascites, albumin I think is 1.2, a horrible body condition. It was like a pit bull mix thing, a little, little dog. And that dog had the dilated lacteals on scoping, and on biopsies is mild to moderate inflammatory bowel disease, and then and then some mild dilation lacteals. But I know when I saw the scope, I felt like the uh, dilation lacteals were definitely more prominent. And then for this dog to be so severe, it's only mild to moderate IBD. So in that case, I really feel probably this dog has lymphagectasia with secondary IBD, uh, IBD. As I mentioned earlier. When you go down with the scope, a lot of times you'll see really, really dilated lacteals. But keep in mind that just because you don't see dilated lacteals on an endoscopy, it doesn't mean that it's not lymphagectasia. Because a lot of times it can be submucosal, and, and that's when you can actually miss it on an endoscopy. And a lot of times it can actually be multifocal in patchy and distribution. So when I get an animal with a, a, any kind of PLE case, now all cases, my dogs and cats, I will always get ileal biopsies also. Um, because sometimes it doesn't have to be just in the duodenum. You know, most of the time when I'm scoping an animal, I could go in probably anywhere from 10 to maybe 20 to maybe 25, 30 centimeters into the small intestine, but I can't go all the way down, way down, you know, in the mid-jejunal section or anything like that. So I try to increase my yield by at least minimally getting duodenal and obviously stomach, then I'll go up and get ileum and, and then colon too. So again, more because of the patchy distribution of both, you know, involved bowel disease for that matter, but, but especially lymphagectasia. If you were to happen to go to surgery with one of these cases, uh, you may see the uh, lipogranulomas on the serosal surface, or sometimes you'll see it on the mesentery. Some people feel that maybe those lipogranulomas that started and may be blocking some of that lymphatic flow, and that's what's causing the dilation on the lacteals on the inside. 
And as stated earlier, they're very fragile. So when you actually have dilated light keels and you actually uh, biopsy them, even uh, just a simple pinch will just pretty much smush them. And even from surgical handling, you really want to be careful, you know, because you can actually still smush, crush the, the, the small uh, sample that you have. Have you ever had any luck doing the corn oil and then follow up with the ultrasound to see them pop? Yeah, no. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. 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 No, no, I haven't. I know that technically if you give a really high-fat diet and such, you can do it. And that's a good point. On ultrasound, you definitely can see these really, um, you know, bright uh, layer within the, the mucosal layer. And I do sometimes think, oh, this may be a lymphatectasia case. But remember, it could be inflammatory bowel disease with dilation. But I haven't. Because a lot of times these animals are really sick and they can't handle the high fat. So it's not worth for me to... You know, because it's not going to make or break me. If I can't see it on ultrasound, I'm not going to say your dog doesn't have it. So for me, it's, it's, it's interesting, but it's not, um, I just worry about the risk of giving really high rich, stuff, uh, uh, rich um, foods or even fatty acid supplements. I, uh, I have a lot of animals that are on fatty acids, and if they have a PLE, I said no more. Because a lot of times fatty acids are great for anti-inflammation, but, but they're, they're still too rich for a GI case. So that's just kind of a picture of my iliocolic. Just to remind me that it's really important that even you have the classic lymphatectasia when you have the duodenal pictures, but sometimes you don't see it, you still want to get ileum, you know. And, and that's where it, it's a pain in the butt for these uh, scopes now because in the past I used to think, oh, small intestine, you have weight loss, you have diarrhea, but there's no urgency, there's no colitis signs. I'm just going to scope the upper GI. I mean, that's where we used to train in residency and internship. I remember just doing the upper, and then, then your other choice would be colonoscopy if it's a, a colitis case. But now, almost a lot of my PLE cases, I always want as many samples as I can, so that means that you have to go through the colon prep now. Because before, you never had a colon prep except for my colonoscopies. And, and, and you really want a very clean colon so that you can go up and get to, into the ileum to get your samples. Someone mentioned, you know, earlier, like how much fat should be in the food, and I think I said 12, I mean 20%, less than 20% of fat uh, on the metabolic uh, energy basis. It's kind of like what you said with your own case, you know, when you have a concurrent IBD case, that's really hard because not all the standard IBD novel proteins, they don't have uh, super, super low fat. I mean, it's sometimes moderate, and in duck, it can be even a little bit high. So um, a lot of times those are the ones that really need that home-cooked diet. We've got to find a formulation, and that's when you have to kind of call the nutritionists that they have other tricks up their sleeve that they make it more palatable where it truly is a home-cooked diet. Now we definitely don't recommend the medium-chain triglycerides anymore. So all those people that know what the word SIBO means, so we don't do MCTs, medium-chain fatty acids anymore. It, it, it really is unpleasant tasting. It really potentially may increase the, the, the risk of diarrhea. And we, we found that maybe not all the medium chains are truly just solely transported by the portal circulation. I mean, that was a thought that you could kind of bypass the lymphatics and then just go into the portal circulation, but that's not always the true. So we, we don't do that anymore. With medical treatment, if inflammation is present, which oftentimes it is with lymphatectasia, I will still use immune suppressive drugs, you know, just similar to IBD. So I go through the same course that I do with IBD, but this time for the diet, I really stress it has to be a low-fat diet. You know, I, I don't always stress the, the novel protein as much. Sometimes I'll try it and see if it still controls it, and you can't get a response initially. I find that sometimes it'll relapse, and I think it has to do with the fat. Because I wonder if the, the, lymphat the, the dilation of the lacteals are just so severe that it's causing inflammation. So when you do a novel protein, it, it may or may not help. It's really the drugs itself. And then ultimately, it's going to get irritated enough that it's, it, the inflammation goes away temporarily because you're on the steroids. But ultimately, the amount of fat the animal is eating is still too much. And then they start popping. And then it's, then it's just this vicious cycle that you can't stop the lacteals from bursting and causing inflammation despite being on the, on the immune suppressive drugs. But for whatever reason, I feel like there are some of those cases that just are not responding to novel protein. And as I taper down the drugs, I just can't get off of them. And then I'll, I might, or I'll have a relapse case, I'll change to low fat if I have that in-between case. So lymphatectasia to me, I, I definitely feel like it's a little bit worse prognosis compared to the standard IBD. Um, but they can still do well, but, I, but like, like I kind of mentioned earlier, it's just that uh, I've had a few cases where they're doing great for like eight months to a year, and then they're coming down with the relapse, and the albumin starts dropping again, and now I haven't really changed much. And I have one case I remember that's kind of up and down, up and down, 
and even without changing any dosing of my drugs. And it was really, really frustrating. Ultimately, I lost that dog. It was a Yorkshire Terrier, and it came in with severe effusion. We even got to the point where we start to think about maybe steroids are not being absorbed, so we will give injectable DEX, you know, underneath the skin so you could bypass a GI. It would help a little bit, but just I can't keep going on it. And most dogs, you just can't stay on DEX forever. You cannot stay on high-dose steroids forever. They end up dying from the, the chronic, you know, horrible steroid reaction than, than to their disease, you know. So, so ultimately, um, that, some of them are just not successful. And that's when I started thinking about, is there a big genetic component? It's not just environmental. There's just something else that's going on with their, that's beyond my control. So then the, the other category of diseases is, you know, cancer. And the biggest one I find is really the, the GI lymphoma cases. And with canines, they're not as responsive as the peripheral kind. And, and since we have Dr. Vancell, you know, he's great. I, I think he had just recent GI um, cancers and such. I'm not going to go into too much detail. But the main thing is that I, I do feel that the GI lymphoma cases, if you have a PLE, especially if you have your fusion, not good. I have yet to see one that really responds well once a fusion is occurring. But it's something that, that, uh, that we can still definitely try, but I feel like the prognosis is not as good. Feline GI lymphosarcoma, however, is much better prognosis. And, and I have a range from 7 to 18 months, but really, if you kind of categorize the small cell lymphoma, you may even say 18 months to 24 months. You know, that's probably the medial survival is probably usually 18, you can say up to even 24. And they could do quite well. A lot of these are older cats, so they're already, you know, 12, 13, 14, and they can have great quality of life uh, once on treatment. And then the ones that kind of lower that, that medial survival time, maybe to, you know, 7, where we're talking about maybe 6 to 9 months, it probably is a large cell lymphomas in cats, and, and that's not as great. And that's why I always tell owners that, that if you have a chronic IBD case, you really want to get a diagnosis. It's still time to scope because people, I owners will come to me and say, hey, my, my animal has IBD. And I always ask, like, how did you diagnose it? And frequently it's not by biopsy. It's just kind of assumption. And then my animal's been on steroids forever, and now it's kind of getting worse, and they usually kind of do a tapering dose, or they may even be off steroids. The, that gives me a red flag that the cat is just getting worse, and, and this is much worse than what it usually does. And I worry about the chronic IBD that was not re well regulated, and then eventually, or even decently regulated, but then ultimately turns into a lymphoma case. And the majority of FELV cases, uh, um, cats are FELV negative, so, so not positive. So those SIBO people, those are also negative now. Often, chronic inflammation transitions to lymphocytic plasmacytic inflammation than lymphosarcoma. I find that they go for lymphoplasmacytic, and then I'll get these biopsies that says lymphoproliferative disease, but they won't call it as lymphoma. I really think that's a gray zone. Those are the cases I always say, well, what is the likelihood of just having one cell line dividing, dividing, and won't stop? To me, that's a little bit unusual. So a lot of times, if I have a lymphocytic proliferation disease in a cat, I, I always will do PRED and chlorambucil, you know, typically. Um, I just feel prednisolone alone. Even though they can respond with prednisolone, but I just do it for the long term because I feel like I'm going to get a shorter remission if I just do prednisolone alone. Again, lymphoblastic lymphomas are the worst. They, um, it, it's, it, you know, my own cat had that, and... Um, and it was, I did chemo and everything, like the whole like Wisconsin Madison died like in three weeks' time. It, it's, a, it's a situation where, where I think they're just more rapid. You know, they just don't respond as well. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit of more supplemental treatments um, that are aside from just our standard IBD and then, you know, uh, uh, drugs and then even like chemo drugs, whatever, but it's really the cobalamin. Cobalamin is one of those things where it often will be, be low, uh, in animals with IBD or lymphoma. It's an essential vitamin that is only absorbed through the ileum. So if I have an animal that has ileal disease, usually cobalamin will be low. But just because it's normal doesn't mean that you don't have ileal disease. But I, I do find that a lot of these are low in, in B12. And I have animals, if I think that you really have a significant GI disease, I'll run a B12, and then it's low, I just tell owners, you really should biopsy. This is something more serious than just a you know, food trial, you know, novel protein, I mean, not novel, um, food intolerance. Usually you're not going to have food intolerance and just have a low B12. So usually I definitely want to um, be a little bit more aggressive with those cases. It's, it's a cofactor involving cell, cellular turnover. It decreases... Um, it, it, it can decrease um, in absorption if the intestine um, integrity is, is broken or the villus atrophy is seen. 
um, and, and, and it really does reduce GI function. It, it is definitely one of those markers that can, with PLE cases, that it may have a negative prognostic indicator. Again, it's absorbed through the ileum. So typically what I do is give sub-Q, make sure it's not mixed with, um, it's not B-complex. A lot of people get that confused with uh, B12 versus B-complex. I know B12 is in B-complex, but it's very little. And so it's, it's always a red fluid or a red um, looking color. It is light sensitive, so what I typically do is draw out my five syringes, and I, I, you know, I used to vet wrap them, you know, so it's kind of protected from light and the syringe, and I always change the needle after I, I get it from the bottle because it does dull the needle, and so that way you have a fresh needle when you want to inject in the cat for the owner. And typically, I would say, uh, I send usually about five doses. A lot of people kind of use a small animals like 250 micrograms, medium size is is 500 and then larger is 1,000 micrograms. So, it's, so usually the, uh, I have the 1,000 micrograms per mil one. So one mil for large animal, medium is 0.5, and then cats are usually 0.25. And then I do for about five doses on average. And then you could transition to monthly. But a lot of times if you treat the underlying disease, you don't need to continue because usually that's in, the integrity heals and you can absorb it in because it's naturally in food. It's not a deficiency. It's not like the food is bad. It's just it's actually pretty easy to get. It's just that you can't absorb it. The folic acid uh, it, low levels can associate with proximal intestinal disease. I used to always do B12 and folic um, uh, folate levels. I don't anymore. I just feel like it, it doesn't help me much uh, for me because I'm not going to supplement fo folic acid and we just don't know. So I, I, just to save a little cost, sometimes I'll just kind of do B12 levels. But people used to think, you know, high folate and, and, and low B12 may suggest it's bacteria, SIBO, you know, but I, I think that's just not, not the case anymore. I do want to state that with the uh, excessive loss in albumin, keep in mind that antithrombin, th uh, it used to be called antithrombin 3, now it's just called antithrombin because there's no one or two. So antithrombin is um, often low. And these are pretty severe PLE cases that they can do wonderful and then suddenly they just kind of die from throwing a clot to their brain. I've had um, two cases that dropped dead on me. I mean, doing okay, and then suddenly just woke up, the animal's dead. And I, I never take it for granted. If I have a low albumin, automatically they're going to be on um, Plavix. And in a very severe case, I'll even put a, a noxaparin, and that's an injectable low molecular weight he um, heparin. This stuff is really expensive, the noxaparin, but um, the nice thing about it, like Walmart and certain pharmacies will sell it by the syringe. It's usually about $30 a syringe. And which is, can be hard because it's, it's a one-time dosing for people. You just kind of give it to yourself with one injection. So what I do, if I have a smaller animal, um, what I'll do is I'll, I don't know if this is even right for me to tell you because I don't know what I'm, what I'm doing, but, but, but I, I put it in a, uh, a red top and then I'll, I'll put uh, sterile saline and it'll be a bit more dilu uh, diluted then. If they're in plump, they have a, there is a formulation of how to dilute it with, with sterile saline, then you put one injection in anoxaparin, then you have a less concentrated form, and then I'll, I'll have them dose it with insulin syringes because 0.1, you know, what, 0.1 mLs is equal to 10 units on a U100 insulin syringe because you're talking about very, very small dosing. And the, the only thing I just, you know, I try to make sure that owners understand this has to be sterile. You're, you're giving it sub-Q, you know, so it's not like IV or anything, but still you don't want to be you know, causing problems. But, but anoxaparin is just kind of hard to dose because there's rarely a, a big enough animal you give one syringe full. And like I said, it's so expensive that originally we're going to try to stock it in our hospital because, you know, for cushionoid dogs that are going to go to surgery or whatever, you know, it's, it's you know, thousands of dollars to get, you have to get the whole pack. So, so it's nice to have uh, them sell it by the single syringe dose. And then some people can do low-dose aspirin instead, and, um, and, and that's, that's fine, too. Uh, I find I still kind of shy away from aspirin just because I guess I, in my mind, I think that sometimes you just can't handle NSAIDs, but it is a very low dose. Low calcium and magnesium. Sometimes you will find that on blood work, and it's, again, it's the same, same concept. You just can't absorb it. It's very rare, but some people will talk about you know, supplementing with calcitriol, magnesium sulfate and even magnesium hydroxide, I have yet to really need that. It's just kind of in the literature, and really no one knows if it'll help or not. And, and be careful about your, your calcium. It may just be total calcium that's super low because your albumin's so low, and your ionized actually can be fine. So don't, don't I, I, it's just in there, but I, I, I have yet to have to supplement truly with magnesium or, or, or calcitriol or calcium. Uh, diuretics, you know, if you have that case that has pretty severe effusion, 
I, I do have to say that you can use some of the diuretics that is furosemide, spironolactone. I find that if you could treat the underlying disease, it's amazing how fast you reabsorb. Once your albumin gets above 1.5, it just kind of disappears overnight almost. I, I really have to do that. But if it is making the ammo really, really uncomfortable, uh, like I said, I, I lost a dog that, that was like a PLE dog. It was pretty severe to, toward the end, very, very severe effusion. We would actually drain the fluid also. And that dog, I even started to um, uh, do anoxaparynx. I didn't know she was showering clots or not, causing some of the effusion because the albumin was low, but sometimes it's not as low as I expected to have her level of effusion. But you can try uh, Lasix and spironolactone. But just be careful about dehydration. A lot of these animals, they have so much effusion that they are truly losing that fluid from their vascular system. And that's why I'm not, I'm not a big fan of draining them all the time unless they're so uncomfortable. Because you pull that abdominal effusion out and you, have, you never fix the oncotic issue, it's going to pull right in. It's going to pull from the vascular system. Now you have a dehydrated animal and you're still going to have that much effusion. Um, but they can't breathe, obviously. Um, that's the, the only thing I could do to quickly alleviate some of the fluid and watch for hypokalemia. And then colloid therapy. So usually these are the ones that if I'm about to scope or go under any anesthetic, they're definitely going to be on some kind of head of starch. I don't use plasma because plasma is really just not enough oncotic pressure uh, to really bring that albumin up. But I will use plasma occasionally if I really feel that antithrombin, there's clues that the animal is showing clots. But I rarely ever have to use plasma. I'm, I'm definitely a head of starch person because um, most of the animals are just a standard PLE. There's no evidence of PTE or, or I, can, I don't see a thrombus on ultrasound. Um, that's causing um, some of the backup of fluid. And lastly is like human albumin. That is a great uh, um, lifesaver sometimes, but the downside is that sometimes it can have delayed reactions, and it's kind of my last resort. I definitely can bring the albumin up pretty high pretty quickly, but the downside is that, again, if you're not treating the underlying cause, which is you're constantly losing it, it's like great, the dog feels great for maybe three days, and then, you, then the fusion goes away, and then it's going to be right back. It's my last ditch effort if I'm really finding the animal has so much effusion, I don't even have the time for the drugs to kick in, I might try that, and then and that way allow the PRED or whatever drugs I'm using to, to kick in. Um, but once you give it, it's like any kind of other... Um, you know, blood products even, the higher, the more increased frequency you give this, this um, antigen, really, and it's human antigen, you're going to have an allergic reaction. There's a good chance. So, so and sometimes you may have anaphylactic reaction just right from the get-go. I would just really use it cautiously, but it's not, um, it really has to be a special case that I kind of pull out albumin, because I still like to get the underlying cause. And we kind of talked about this as supplemental where, again, you're trying to change the flora a little bit with metronidazole, tylosin, or doxycycline. And the prognosis, you know, it's really variable. Um, I, I've had, you know, some animals that are out like three years with PLE. I just have to check them periodically, and they're just still doing great. Uh, but relapses are common. So this is one where I, I feel like the owner sometimes kind of lose touch with the vet because, oh my gosh, he's doing great, don't even really think about following up anymore, and the next you know, they're going to albumus at 1.0 again, and the animal's not even showing clinical signs until the diarrhea comes in, that's why they come in to see the vet. So I, I tell owners that you still want to be monitoring the albumin, even if you're well-regulated, because a lot of times that's going to be a sub subclinical marker that it's coming down again, and you might have to go back up on their steroid, because a lot of times you're, you're low, 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 and you may even be able to wean off and just be on novel protein diet if it's a true food allergy diet, um, uh, responsive um, um, IBD, for example. And a lot of times when I find a relapser, it's hard to get them back. It's just really frustrating. Usually I'm adding second or third tier drugs when I have a relapser. So some people feel that, that you know, it can be technically a guarded prognosis when you have the low albumin. Because it's not your standard IBD that doesn't have low albumin at all, just kind of chronic vomiting, diarrhea, but, you know, is fine. But when your albumin is super low, I feel like those are not as good. So that's why it makes sense to have, when you start pulling, the, you know, those, those index numbers and such, you, you'll see that anything that has hypoalbuminemia and hypocolobalaminemia uh, and ascites, those are all negative prognostic indicators. So, and, and someone brought up a good uh, uh, question for me d during the break just about um, fiber responses. Fiber work, and yes, it definitely does for colitis. I don't find um, that as effective when a PLE case, um, but, the, but it's great for, you know, co uh, co um, it's fiber responsive colitis. Any other questions or comments? And I think that's it.